Job's going to show you. He's going to Job. The book of Job will show us where we're at in our Christian walk. It will show you. Now, as I'm teaching, put yourself in Job's place. The things that I'm going to uh, be saying, scriptures that I'm going to be using. Put yourself in Job's place. I mean, to get a good understanding, put yourself in Job's place. When we start talking about what happened to him and why and blah, 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 put yourself in his place. Can I do what Job did? Like I said, Job Job is going to teach you, he's going to teach us where we are with the Lord. If we're just here and we're just playing the, the Christian game, or are we really seriously living for the Lord? That's what Job is going to, this is what this book is going to teach us. Some religious leaders teach that if we suffer, it's because we're not righteous. Because we're not right with God. We're not walking with the Lord. There's religions out there that teach that. Especially the ones that say, name it, claim it. If you ain't got it, it's because you, you don't have enough faith. Or you're not righteous enough. Or, you, or you're not walking with the Lord. That's what they're saying. If you watch the, the, the TV or even if you've gone to go see some, they'll tell you. Righteous people, Christians, shouldn't suffer. But we need to remember Isaiah 57, 12. Now I will expose your so good, so-called good deeds. None of them will help you. That verse right there is telling us none of your good deeds, none of your righteous, your now it's talking about our righteousness, okay? Our goodness, being a, a morally good person, okay? That's what it's talking about here. Us being a good person will not help us. Like I said, there's people out there who really believe that if your good outweighs your bad, you'll make it to heaven. But right here it says, your, so go your so-called good deeds, the things you think that are good, none of them will help you. Also on Isaiah 64, 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. So what's the Lord calling our... Us being good, what's the Lord calling it? Filthy rags. Our goodness that God... And I'm talking about ours. Our goodness that we think is good, the Lord's looking down at us and saying, Hey, it's nothing but filthy rags. Now, we're talking about the righteousness of man, yeah. not the righteousness of God. Don't lose me. So the Lord looks, as a, looks at our righteousness, our goodness, being a good, moral person. He looks at it as filthy rags. Titus 3, 5, the one I use all the time. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done. Again, He saved us not, not because we were good people. But because of His mercy, He washed away our sins. And what do you have to do for Him to wash away your sins? You have to accept Him as Lord. You have to repent of your sins so you, He can wash them away. Giving us a new birth. And what's the, what do we call that? Being born again. And a new life through the Holy Spirit. So again, right here in Titus 3, 5, He says, Your goodness doesn't count. Your righteousness doesn't count. Until you become a born again Christian. And you're living through the Holy Spirit. And the Lord washes away your sins. For Him to wash them away, you have to repent of them. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. As it is written, There is none righteous. No, not one. This is the Word of God. There's, this, this is just showing us our righteousness. You know people out there that are good. I mean good people. They'll take the shirt off their back to help you. But if they're not a born again Christian, if they're not born again Christian, these verses are shown right here. There is none righteous. None. Not one. And the ones who do have this righteousness, so, so called good, he said it's filthy rags to him. Whoever's listened to this CD, if you think you'll make it to heaven because you're a good person, Better, better read these scriptures yourself. Verse 11 says, There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. That's what I'm saying. These are people who think their righteousness is good enough to get to heaven. Because they're not seeking after God. That's what it says right here. There is none that seeketh after God. 
These people up here who think they're righteous, who think they're good, they're not seeking after God. It's their own righteousness that they're seeking. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's saying here, God has shown us a way to be right with Him without keeping the law. There was two ways of salvation. There's plan A and there's plan B. Plan A is for people who want to keep the law and not break not a single law and make it to heaven. And then plan B is God's mercy. Give your life to the Lord. Now there was only one person who was able to do plan A. And that was Jesus. He came down here, walked the earth, and never sinned. Now before we can even read the Ten Commandments, we done broke them. So we can forget about plan A. So the Lord is saying right here, plan A, uh uh-uh. Plan A, you're not going to make it. God has shown us the way to get right with Him is not by keeping, okay, I live by the Ten Commandments, that's going to get me to heaven. Mm Mm-mm. Giving your heart to the Lord is what's going to get you to heaven. And it was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament. Remember the Old Testament? It's all about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. Everything. Every book you read in here has Jesus in it. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of... Oh, excuse me. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is the true for everyone who believes, no matter who. You know, there's nobody out there who cannot be forgiven. Anybody who wants to be a believer, and remember what I said, believing is, is not just believing with your, with your mind. Believing comes from the heart. Like I said before, Satan, he believes more than me and you, right? Because he's seen God. In fact, we're going to see in Job, he, he talks to God. So Satan believes more than you and I do. But he ain't making it. So the word believe is not just, oh, I believe in God. It doesn't matter who you are either. There's nobody out there in this world that God cannot forgive. No matter what they've done. No matter what they've done. He can forgive anyone who, who wants it. Verse 23. For all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. There's no one here on this earth that's perfect. And I'm sorry. But the Catholics. They believe Mary was a perfect woman. It doesn't say right here. It says what it says. All have sinned. That includes Mary. Because Mary was just like you and I. She was a human being. She was, she was just like us. And he didn't leave her name out. I mean, he didn't put her name in here and and said, except Mary. No, he said, all have sinned, all. Every man that's ever worked on earth has sinned, except Jesus. Jesus came as 100% man, but also at the same time, he was 100% God. And that's why he was able to walk the earth with no sin. But all have sinned. So nobody can think they're so righteous and... They don't have sin because they live such a good life. No, he says right here, all have sinned and come short of his glory. Without the Lord not being born again, as you can see, we have no righteousness. Without getting born again, we have no righteousness. You think your little old grandmother, and I'm talking about just your grandmother, I'm talking about you, little, little grandmothers out there, oh, she's so sweet and kind, unless your little old grandmother is born again, she ain't making it. You hear me? She's not making it. So we got to quit thinking, oh, my grandmother or or whoever. I just use grandmothers because they're used a lot. Nobody ever talks bad about grandmas. (laughs) But uh, that's why you need to read the scripture and see nobody out there is good enough, is good enough to make it without Jesus. So when you go to these funerals, Every funeral you've ever been to, did they say, well, I'm sorry, but this person's going to hell? Nope. You ain't been to a funeral where that has been preached. Everybody 
All the funerals I've ever been to, they all made it to heaven. People need to open their eyes. They need to open their eyes to the Word of God and see what He says. Because we like to say, well, oh, he was, he was a good person. All these scriptures I've given you, write them down, keep them with you, so you can keep reminding yourself, hey, goodness does not get me to heaven. Goodness is not going to get you to heaven. Or you, or you, or you. Whoever you know that's trying to make it by being good. You need to be born again. You need the righteousness of God. Once you have the righteousness of God, now, now we're talking. Now you do have righteousness. It's not of yourself. It comes from the Lord. Lord says, bad things are going to happen to us also, to the Christians. He does. He's Matthew 5.45. He says, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth his reign on the just and on the unjust. Just meaning you're justified with the Lord. Or you're, you're unjust. Or you're not justified with the Lord. But that's what the just and unjust means. He says, even if you're justified with me, it's still going to rain on you. And we're going we're gonna to learn this through this teaching. We're going to learn why it rains on the Christians. The Lord never said, nowhere in the Bible did the Lord said. I'm not going to let it rain on you. From now on, everything in your life is going to be good. He never said that, right? He never said that. We can make it through whatever he sends on us with him. But it's still going to come on us. Just like Job, who was a righteous man, can suffer when God allows it. Job was a righteous man. We're going to find out he was a very righteous man. And God allowed for all this stuff to happen to Job. God allowed it. Now you can suffer in other ways. If you're not walking with the Lord, then you can suffer in other ways. And that suffering, believe me, you're really going to suffer. Because you, when you're a righteous person and you're suffering and the Lord allows this, whatever it is to come on you, if you're walking with the Lord, believe me, it's a whole lot better to go through it with Him than to go through it without Him. And I know that firsthand. You know, you all know that. If it wasn't for the Lord, I would have made it through my, my, my trial that I went through. Just like the world, when they lose a child or whatever, most of the time, they'll either turn to alcohol, they'll turn to drugs, they'll commit suicide, they'll go into a depression. That's how they make it through these trials, is that way. We make it through these trials with the Lord, if, we're ours, if our eyes are with them. So there's two ways of suffering. Suffering with the Lord, suffering without the Lord. And we're going to see what Job did here. Verse 1 of Job. There was a man in the land of Oz or Uz or whatever, however you pronounce that, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and and excused evil. Perfect and upright. All that means, doesn't mean that Job was perfect. The word perfect, the Lord has said that we need to be perfect like he is perfect. Well, what he was saying is we need to be complete. The word perfect means complete. And the only way you can be complete is by having Jesus. So what he's saying here, that uh, it means he's right with God. He's a Christian man. He fears the Lord. All right, that's what it says. Fear means he knows the Lord. He knows the Lord, and he knows the Lord doesn't play around. So he didn't play around with the Lord, who feared, who feared God. Some of us, some, some people out there playing are are playing games. That's not fearing the Lord. And there's a lot of people out there. They're playing games. They don't have the fear in the Lord in them. And not having the fear in the Lord in you, that'll get you in trouble. That'll get you in trouble. We need the fear of God in us. We need to know He's not playing games with us. He knows if we're right or wrong. He knows where our heart is. He knows where our heart is better than we know where our heart is. In fact, in Hebrews 4.12, He says He shows us where our heart is. So we don't play games with the Lord. We can't. We might play games with people who don't know our hearts. But we can't play games with the Lord. That's why Job feared God. He feared him because he knew God wasn't playing games with him. Verse 2 and 3. 
And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all men in the east. What does it say here? Job was the greatest of all men in the east. Remember that. He had, it just, it's showing you right here what all he had. Job was a very wealthy man. He, li- he lived like a, what do you call him, sheik? Is that the way you call him? A sheik? They lived like kings. They're not kings, but they lived like kings. That's how rich he was. And it says that he was the greatest of all men in the east. He was very well respected. Verse 4. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feastings were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now right here, this, these verses are shown that Job was the spiritual head. Okay, it was shown he was the spiritual head. He was the priest of the family. Just like it says in First Peter chapter 3, verse 6, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Now it's Lord with a little L. But Sarah, the wife, called her husband Lord because he's the head of the house. He's the spiritual head of the house. And that's why Sarah called Abraham Lord because the man is the head of the house. But just remember, that's a small L. That's not a capital L. Even with his sons and daughters living in their own homes, he sent for them and they obeyed him. Not only do kids are supposed to obey their parents when they're young, but these, his, his sons and daughters were already grown up in their own houses. And he said, come. And they came. The head of the house is the head of the house. I don't ever stop being the head of Teresa until I'm gone. Now, she's got her husband, but I'm talking about her here. She is still my daughter. Like, like if anything happens to her, I, I'm, I'm supposed to take her back in and totally take care of her. Totally. I'm not supposed to tell her, well, you know, you need to go find a job. and No, uh The head of the house, the Bible always had it where the head of the house took care of the woman. The women are always under the male, always. From the very beginning of the time, all through the Bible, the Lord has always had the woman under a man. First her father, then her husband. And if something happened to her husband, she goes back to her father. If her father's not there, then she goes to the next of male kin, which we learned that in the book of Boaz. In in the Old Testament they had in the Old Testament they had church their way. In the Old Testament they had church. And making sure that they were right with the Lord and they followed him, he would have forgiveness over their sins through burnt offerings. These offerings could be with a young bull. It could be with a lamb, a goat, a turtle dove, or a pigeon. But they had to be clean. Those are things, those are animals they could sacrifice in the Old Testament. These are animals, but they had to be clean. They couldn't be sick or any kind of spots on them. You know, they had to be animals with no diseases. This was to show that the animal, you know, was taking the person's place. Instead of the person being killed for his sin, is we're, we're killing the animal, sacrificing the animal so we could have, so they could have forgiveness of their sin. Now this is Old Testament, the animal sacrifices. And Job made these sacrifices so he could restore his children's relationship with God. Now he was the head of the house and this is why he did that. When you read the Old Testament, you'll see that all the, he'll see that what he did is what Jesus did. Job learned from Jesus. Now don't, well, the New Testament wasn't written. No, what did I just say a while ago? Jesus is all through the Bible from Genesis on. Jesus. He learned just like what Jesus did. He learned that the priest of the house could have this authority. He did it just like Jesus. In fact, Hebrews 7.25, it says, Wherefore he, speaking of Jesus, is able to also to save them to the uttermost 
that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So just like Jesus makes intercession for us, because he's come, he died on the cross, right? He shed his blood. Now he has intercession for us. Well, in the Old Testament, Jesus hadn't done that, so that's why they had animal sacrifices. But Job was like a Jesus. He would, th- he would call them and tell them, we're going to do this so you can get forgiveness of your sins. He was the head. He made sure this was done with his family. That's why I say, men, it's very important that you know what being the head of the family means. It's always been that way in the Bible. The head of the family is the man, and he is responsible to know these things. Now, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Sons of God. Right here, sons of God means angels. In this verse. Now listen to me. Sons of God in this verse means angels. The angels came to God and Satan came with them. Now there are many who believe, and Jody can tell you this because at the camp we had a guy saying this. There are many who believe that sons of God means angels, which it does here in this verse. In Genesis 6-2 it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Remember? The guy said, these sons of God means there were angels. Angels came down and had sex with the women. That's what they believe. Because right here, sons of God does mean angels. But there, I'm going to show you in another place that it doesn't mean angels. All right. So Genesis 6, 2 that I just read to you is not talking about uh, angels in, in heaven. Sons of God in, in Genesis 6, 2 means what it says in Hosea, Hosanna. 110, it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Speaking to the Jews, the children of Israel, Jews, right? Now, it says, Ye were not my people. Now, what happened here was Israel was worshiping other gods. So God told them to go ahead and marry prostitute women, the men, to marry prostitute women because that's the way they were acting. That's why I say there's spiritual adultery, just like physical adultery, just like there's grounds for divorce on physical adultery. Well, there's grounds for divorce for spiritual adultery. And this right here was spiritual adultery. Israel was worshiping other gods and God called it that they they were doing it just like going to prostitutes like a man going to a prostitute or someone other than his wife you understand what I'm saying but I'm showing you right here what I'm showing you children of Israel they are the sons of God so if you read this verse now you can take this verse and put it with Genesis 6 2 that the sons of God speaking about the Jews here Sons of God, that means Jews. Saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them as wives. Not angels. They take Job up here and say, well, sons of God means angels. Well, yeah. But in Hosanna, it means Jews. The Lord is going to show us why we go through rough times using this book. Satan came also among them. We have an enemy who is after us. That's why the Lord gave us some armor to put on. As we learned in the parables, that we have an enemy. Remember? The enemy came in and planted the weeds with the wheat. They called him the enemy. Well, the Lord's calling the enemy here. He is an enemy. And this is why in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 8, you don't have those. If you want to turn there, you can. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, it says, Finally, my brethren, Be strong in the Lord. Okay? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. In the Lord and in His might. We need to be strong through Him. Many of us are trying to be strong in our own power. I know the Lord said to do it this way, but I think if I do it this way, it's better. 
People always are trying to outthink God, outsmart God. And my example I will use is wives. Wives, you're always trying to fix your husband. Instead of just taking them to the taking it to the Lord in prayer and Lord, do something with them. We try to y'all try to fix us. You see you hear me? This is not doing it in the Lord. This is doing it in your own power. Well, I'm just I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that. I'll show him. Mm -mm. Women, when you want to take the place of God, guess what? You're going to make a bigger mess. We need to learn. We need to learn how to do it in the Lord and in His might. Meaning, we need to go to Him. If the devil's messing with us, and I'm going to get a little bit more on that. If the devil's messing with us, we don't go fight the devil. Well, this is what I'm going to do. No. We take it to the Lord and say, Lord, the devil's doing this or or he's doing that. We take it to the Lord, because it's the Lord's fight. He says it over and over, and I'm going to show that. Verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. He said to put on the whole armor, and then what? Stand. Did he say attack? He didn't say attack the devil. He said, once you put all my armor on, stand. Verse 12, For we wrestle not against the flesh and, bl- flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. Now he does say to wrestle, but he's going to tell us how to wrestle. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Does the Lord have us attacking? He keeps telling us, stand, stand. The Lord knew we were going to have good days and He knew we were going to have evil days. In the Old Testament, like Joshua, who was in many many battles, well, they were in the city. They had the walls around the city. They felt protected behind them walls. And they had some some nations that wanted to come up against Joshua. They were were in, in their city with walls around the city and they felt protected, okay? God told Joshua to take to, for him and his army, his men, to go outside the walls and stand. They feel protected behind them walls. Or we're protected here. But God told them, God said, go outside these walls and stand there. And they did. And somehow, some way, those people that were up against them didn't win. Now, this is a whole, another teaching in itself. I'm not going to get into it. But what I'm trying to show you here, we might have our own little whatever we think it is. Well, I feel good here. But God is saying, no, that's just a wall. That's material. You go out there and stand. Like I said, do what I said. Follow me and I'll take care of you. And what did they do? They listened. They didn't understand. God, we're behind these walls. They can't get us here. They didn't understand why God wanted them to go outside that walls. But they did. They listened to God. Even though we don't understand sometimes when He tells us to do something, sometimes we don't, well, many times we might not understand. Well, Lord, why do you want me to do that? We need to listen and obey God. And He will take care of us just like He did right here. They went outside the walls and did they fight them? No, they didn't fight them. They went outside the walls and stood. And won the battle. Got to read the book of Joshua. It's a good book. But what I'm trying to show is they stood there. God said to stand. Just like he's telling us up here. Put on the whole armor and to stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Exodus 14. Verses 13 and 14. And Moses said unto the people. Fear ye not. Stand still. Moses said to the people, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Even Moses understood that as Christians, as believers, we're to stand and it's God's fight. Moses said it right here. Verse 14, The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Lord shall fight for you. It's all through the Bible. The Lord fights for us. There's no reason for us to go out there and fight. We put on the whole armor of God and then we stand. Psalms 46.10 Be still and know that I am God. Be still 
and know that I am God. Verse 15. And your feet sh shone with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fury of darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, and watching thereon too with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. Supplications and with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit. What that means is when you don't know what to pray, the Spirit will, give, will show you what to pray. Now this does mean two things. The Spirit can give you the words to say, like, you know, when you're praying and and he'll put it on you to pray for whoever. But then it also means speaking in tongues. It does mean that. It doesn't, it doesn't say that you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. But it does say when you don't know what to pray, that the Spirit will, will take over. Now either he's going to do it in English, like we speak, or he's going to do it in tongues. And like I said, that's another teaching. I'm not going to teach that. But it does mean speaking in tongues also. Now he's given us truth, which means the knowledge of biblical teaching. He's given us the breastplate of righteousness, which means living daily, moment by moment, in obedience to him. He's given us a shield, or for those or for us who take refuge under him, under his protection. Helmet of salvation, salvation. We are secure in our great hope of being saved. The sword of the Spirit, which we see, is the, which is the Word of God. He's given us the Word of God. And prayer. Having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Almighty God. He's given us all this. But nowhere did He say, go out there and fight. He says, I'll fight the fight. You just stand. Praise God. I mean, do you hear me? 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not cardinal. But mighty God, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we don't have weapons like real swords. We have the word of God. That's our sword. Isn't that you that has great faith? God says he's given us everything, even faith, to believe in him. The only thing that's ours is our will. You, he said your will is yours. But I give you everything else. But your will is yours. Do like you want with it. You want to accept me? It's your will. If you don't want to accept me, that's your will. So he's given us all the will. And it's up to us if we want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. He's given us the faith to do it. He's given us the power to follow. He's given us everything. You have religious people out there who are standing. They're standing. But while they're standing, they're yelling and stomping their feet at the devil. You got people out there who a group they get in prayer meetings and they're fussing and yelling at the devil. I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus, and you and that's not right, people. Even though it's yelling, but you're praying to someone you can't see, you're recognizing them as a God. Now do you hear me? Screaming and hollering at the devil is recognizing him as being a God. Because he's not right there with you where you can see him. So apparently he must be a God because you're praying to him. It might be in yelling, but you're still praying to him, right? The, the devil doesn't care how you do it as long as you do it. Because you know why? Because he's always wanted to be God. And where, when you have these people who are yelling and screaming at the devil and rebuking them, well, they're doing exactly what the devil wants. They're praying to him and you pray to a God. You understand what I'm saying? That's, I'm telling you it's that way. Prayer is for God only. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to pray to anyone else. So whoever you're praying to, that's who you're recognizing as being a God. Hear what I'm saying. The Catholics, stop praying to Mary. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to pray to Mary. Stop praying to Mary. Repent and stop praying to Mary. She's not your mother. She's our sister. She's our sister in the Lord because she, she was a Christian. So she's our sister. But she's not mother of God, and she's not our mother. I'm going by the scriptures. The scriptures. Your religion might teach you that, but it's not the word of God. Mary was just a woman. She was a blessed woman. 
But that's it. When the disciple brought Jesus, uh, Mary to Jesus, and they said, your mother wants to talk to you, Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my mother and brother? He said, those who are my mother and brother are the ones who follow me. That's who my mother and brother is. Did he make a big deal about saying anything about Mary being the mother of all? No, he didn't. So if there's any Catholics out there listening to this, repent. Repent and stop praying to Mary. Nowhere in the Bible does it say to pray to Mary or to anyone else. There's nowhere in the Bible where all the prayers that you find in the Bible, none of them, none of them, the disciples, the, the prophets, none of them prayed to the devil. We started doing that. We started hollering and screaming at the devil. They didn't. That's not biblical. No, nobody did that in the Bible. Nobody did that in the Bible. So we need to quit. Even though we're yelling at them and fussing at them, we're still praying to them. We need to still. We need to repent and stop doing that. In Matthew chapter six, the Lord taught us how to pray, and He started saying. He started by saying, "Our Father." The Lord's prayer. It starts off with "Our Father." That was the Lord said, I'm going to teach you to pray. This is how you pray. And he started off by saying, Our Father. Did he have it in there where it said, Hail Mary, full of grace? Was that prayer in the Bible? No, you will not find it in the Bible. So since it's in the Bible, why are people saying, Hail Mary, full of grace? When she was a sinner, just like us. She's the one who said, remember, she's the one who said, I rejoice in God my Savior. And only lost people need saviors. With her saying, I rejoice in God my Savior, she is admitting of being a sinner. Because only sinners need a Savior. The Lord said in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee to you, from you. So the best way to fight the devil, did he say to scream at him? Did he say to pray to him? Talk to him? No. He said the best way to fight the devil where he'll flee from you, he said the best way is to submit yourself to him, to God. Submit yourself to me and the devil will flee. That's the way you fight the devil, is by getting closer to God. Amen? Nowhere in the Bible does our shepherd, who's our shepherd? God. Because we're sheep, right? The Bible says we're sheep. Nowhere in the Bible does our shepherd tell us the sheep to go fight a lion or a bear. Is that anywhere in the Bible where God said for us to go fight? He said stand. The fight is His. Our shepherd does the fighting. We're the sheep. He protects us. And like I said again, I'll say it again. The shepherd does not tell the sheep to go fight the bear or the lion or whatever wolf is out there. Our God doesn't tell us to do that. Our God is our protector and He does the fighting. Verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth and watching everything that's going on. And he can do that. Why? Because it's Ephesians 2.2, 2, which says he is the prince power of the air. So he can do that. Because he is the prince, the power of the air. The Lord knew where he was at. You think the Lord didn't know where Satan was at? He asked him, where you been? You think the Lord didn't know? <laughs> no, the Lord knew. What he, he's kind of like treating the devil like a child. Where you been? Just like parents with little kids. We know where they've been. But we'll ask them, where you been? Yeah. <laughs> you okay? God has shown us here who is in authority. Because Satan answered him. God is God. God asked Satan a question. Satan had to answer him because he is still God. Not, not the devil, not Satan. <clears throat> Verse 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and eschew evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Do Job fear God for naught? What are you saying, Job? Does Job fear God for anything? At this time, Job doesn't. This, uh, he don't fear the Lord for anything. Why? Because his eyes are on the Lord and he's walking with the Lord. So if he's doing that, why should he fear the Lord? It's when you're not walking with the Lord that you should fear him. 
But there was no reason for Job to fear to, for the, to the Lord at this time. Because Job was what? The greatest men of the East. He was, what does it say? Perfect and upright. Job was a very godly man. He didn't have no reason to fear God for nothing. And the reason <clears throat> is because Job was walking with the Lord. And he was obedient. He was obedient to God. Do you know how important it is to be obedient to the Lord? Do we know that? It's kind of hard to walk with the Lord when you're not obeying Him. Don't you think? It's kind of hard to walk with Him. If you're not obeying Him, how are you walking with Him? So it's very important that you be obedient to the Lord. Verse 10. Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. This is what God can do for you when you obey. He can he puts a hedge around you and he gives you all your he gives you what you need plus more. A lot of times he'll give you your needs plus and that's what it's saying right here. He put a hedge around him because he was obeying God. The hedge, what does that mean? Hedge is him taking care of you, protecting you and supplying all your needs. That's what the hedge is. In uh, Moses, when he went up to get the Ten Commandments, Moses asked God, when Moses was up there getting the Ten Commandments, Moses asked God, who do I tell them, the Jews down there, Israel, who do I tell them sent me? That's what Moses asked God. And in Exodus 3.14, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So what he's saying is, I am. What does God mean by that? God is saying, whatever you need, that's what I am. You need protection? I am your protection. You need strength? I am your strength. So that's what, that's what he's saying. right? I am whatever you need, that's what I am. That's what he was saying here. Verse 11. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. So the devil's telling God, take your hand away from him, take your protection away from him, and he will curse you to your face. That's what Satan is telling God. The devil is attacking God and Job before the angels. At the very beginning, it was he said the sons of God and Satan came before before God. Sons of God is who? Angels. angels. So the angels and Satan came before God. And Satan, Satan came before God in front of the angels. So right here, he's attacking God and he's attacking Job. In front of all the angels. For Satan to talk to, to, to God, where do you have to be? His night wasn't here on earth. He had to be in heaven. And where's the angels? In heaven. When, when Satan is saying, what, sa what Satan is saying, because you give him all these things, because you've given him all these things, you're buying his love. That's what the devil was saying. That's why he lives for you. That's why He obeys you, because you give Him everything He needs. That's what He's saying right here. God, uh, the devil says, God, if you take all that He has, meaning His possessions, the devil's saying, if you take all that away from Him, He will turn from you. That's what He told God. You're buying His love. He's accusing God of buying Job's love. That's why I'm saying He's attacking God, and He's attacking Job in front of the angels. When y'all read Job... Is this what y'all were getting? Yeah. That the devil was attacking God and Job in front of the angels. Remember, the Lord allowed this to happen to him. So Job, the reason he allowed it was so Job could prove to the devil and to prove to the angels that his love for the Lord was from his heart. So God allowed the devil to do the things he did to Job so Job can prove to the devil and to the angels in heaven that no God would, did not buy his love from Job. Job did it on his own. He loved the God, he loved the Lord out of his own heart, 
Not because God was giving him everything. So he's giving Job an, uh, 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 an opportunity to prove the devil wrong. Job didn't know what reason he was going through all these trials and tribulations. He didn't know why. He didn't know that Satan and, and God had, a, had, a, had a, a discussion. Okay? Remember, Satan, I mean, Job doesn't know none of this. We, we see it because he's, he's teaching us. But at this time, Job does not know that Satan and God had a talk. And Job was the middle of it. All, all Job knows is, man, all of a sudden he's going through a lot of trials and tribulations. But he did know that it wasn't for any sin that he committed. Doesn't mean he was sinless. He just knew he wasn't being punished or going through these trials because of some sin. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes, well, many times, if we're sinning, the Lord will chastise us. But Job knew, hey, I'm walking with God. I don't know why all this is happening, but I know it's not happening because of some sin I've committed. Because if the Lord would have pointed it out to me, Job, being a very righteous man, would have repented. So here Job knows, I don't know why this is happening to me. It's not because I've done anything wrong. Not that he was sinless. He had sinned. He was a man just like us. But he wasn't being going through these trials because of a sin. The Lord already knew what Job was going to do. Okay? The Lord already knew. Because He knows everything. That's why He told us about the tribulation. That's why He told us about uh, the new earth, the new heavens. He's already, he's already seen all this come about. He foresees everything. The question we have, can the Lord rely on us? If, if the devil was to come and say, God, take everything away from Jody. Take everything away from Lindsay. Take everything away from Brandon and see what happens. But put yourself in Job's place. Joe, Jody, if God took me, took your job, if He took all that away from you, would you still bow down and worship God? Like I said, don't answer. It's a question for you. And it's a question for y'all. Same thing. If God takes everything away from you, and we're going to find that's what the devil did. If God takes everything away from you, think about it. Think about all the precious things that are very precious to you. And, God, and, and, and it was all taken away. Would you still praise God? Okay, that's what I'm saying. Job will teach us where we're at. If you lose your job, we're going to blame God. We're going to get mad at God. If you lose your spouse or your child, in whatever way, through death, divorce, whatever. If you lose the closest thing to you, how are you going to, re how are you going to react? If you lose your health, Brandon, you're a nice, healthy man. You're in good health. If God took that away from you, how would you, re how would you react to the Lord? These are questions. Ask yourself. And they're very serious questions. These are not play around questions. These are very serious questions. What answer did we come up with? Ask yourself. What answer did you come up with? Was it a good answer or a bad answer? That's what I'm saying. Job is going to teach us. This book is going to teach us where we're at with the Lord. And I'm very serious. Think about it. If you lost a person who has been very close to you, or you lost everything you had, your job, your house, your car, everything. If you was to lose all this, would you still praise God? Ask yourself that question. If the answer is not right, then what do we have to do? One, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to be to where I'm still going to praise you. Even though if you take everything away from me, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. If we're not at that point, then now we know what we need to do. We need to get closer to our Father. I'm serious. Are y'all listening to me? This is very serious. Job is a very serious... They're all serious books. But Job, that's what I'm saying. Are y'all ready for Job? Because Job, the book of Job is going to show you where you're at. And if you're honest, if you're really sincerely honest in your heart, then you know what your answer is. Because you're not going to fool anybody else. In fact, you're not going to tell us what your answer is. You know what your answer is. God knows what your answer is. And guess what? You can't fool the Lord. Oh Lord, oh yes, I would still praise you. He knows your heart. You can't lie to Him. Or if it, or if it is for real, or you, if you can really say, Yes God, I will still praise you. And the Lord knows your heart and it's true. 
Praise God. Praise God. Okay? Praise God. Because you have tremendously grown up in the Lord. The hardest part of being tested is the length of time. Just like my little girl Tara. What happened was hard. But what was harder was how long it lasted. I mean, you, the Lord just didn't say, okay, you're okay now the next day. No. In fact, I pretty much tell you, it took me about eight months. For eight months, I didn't want to do anything. I got up, I ate, I went to work. I did the things the Lord wanted me to do. But I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't happy. I was just, I was down. But at the same time, I still love the Lord. But about eight months after she died, well, let me say, I don't hate saying it that way. About eight months after she went to be with the Lord, I'm sitting in church and the Lord spoke to me and said, Okay, Jesse, you've had enough time. Let's get back to work. I'm serious. I am very serious. This is what God told me. When you hear people say, I heard that still small voice from God, well, that's what I heard. And God told me. It was, it was eight months later. He said, Jesse, okay, that's enough. Let's get back to work. Now, for some people, it might be longer. For some people, it might be shorter. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, the time when the trial is, when you're being tested or, or whatever it is, the time, that's what makes it hard. Okay, if it's a long time, it makes the trial harder. Sometimes we don't, I could have said, hmm, I'm not ready. And not listen to the Lord. And, st and stayed like I was for another eight months. I could have done that. But I didn't. People can make the time of testing hard. With Job, it was his friends and family. We're going to find that his friends and his family, his wife, made it hard for him. We're going to find later on, and I'll just say real quick, his wife, his wife told him to turn from God, to, cur to curse God and die. His wife told him that. So times of being, when you go through trials and tribulations, whatever they may be, time makes it hard, but then being around the wrong people makes it harder. Do you see what I'm saying? We should worship God for being God. Period. If you hear anything tonight, listen to this. We should worship God for being God. That's it. Not because of what He gives us. We, not even because He saved us. Not even because of that. Because we didn't deserve it, right? We don't deserve it. His mercy gave it to us. His love gave it to us. It wasn't because we deserved it. So not even because of that. We should just worship God because He is God. Period. We should worship God because He is God. A true God. A real God. A living God. Some, uh, sometimes my teaching turns into preaching, I think. You will see at the end of this teaching... At the end of your trials, if you stay focused on the Lord, if you stay focused on the Lord through your being tested or trials, whatever you're going through, if you stay focused on the Lord, you will be blessed. It's either going to be here in this world, in this earth, while you're here at this time. It's either going to be now, or it's going to be in heaven. Remember, there's rewards in heaven. There's different stages in heaven. But if you stay, if you go through these trials, these tests and stay focused on the Lord, you will be blessed. We might not, like I said, we might not know, just like Job, we might not know why this is happening to us. But at the end, if we stay focused on God, we will be blessed. God is giving Job a chance to prove to the devil that he's wrong and that he was a liar. And he'll prove it to the angels that God is a loving, caring, and forgiving God. Verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. One thing we learn here for sure, that Satan had to ask to get permission to do whatever he wanted to do with Job. Satan had to go to God and ask for his permission. Satan cannot do nothing to us unless God says it's okay. Y'all hear me? Satan cannot touch you or do anything to you. Hear me. Satan cannot touch you or do anything to you unless God allows it. And if God allows it, then he's on your side. He's, gonna, he's allowing the devil to do this, but also at the same time, just like Job, 
Job knew God was still there with him. That's what our faith is in. If the devil does attack me for whatever reason it may be, God is with me. So we find that the Satan, Satan has to get permission from God to do anything. Just like in Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31, when Jesus was telling Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times a night. And he also told Peter, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan had asked Jesus if he could do this to Peter. So it's not just right here in Job. Jesus told Peter, Satan has asked. Satan didn't tell Jesus, I'm going to do this to Peter. Y'all hear me? Satan did not tell Jesus. Satan asked Jesus if he could do this to Peter. Just like he's asking God right here if he can do these things to Job. Amen? Amen. Who is more powerful? So what king do you want to live for? A king that, that has a king over him? Or the king that has no other king over him? That is king of all. King of kings. That's who I want to belong to. King of kings. This ought to give you a great comfort knowing this. If if the devil attacks you, if he does, God has allowed it. And the only reason he's allowed it is because he knows, just like he knew with Job, he knows you can go through it. If you keep your eyes on him. Now verses 13 through 19 is when Satan started to work on Job. And I'm not going to read them all. I'm just going to tell you. His animals were stolen and his farm hands were killed. Fire burned up his sheep and his shepherds. And they stole his camels and killed the servants. And his children were all dead. If you read verses 13 through 19, that's what you're going to find. This is all what happened to him through, from 13 to 19, through, through 19. He lost all this. And in verse 20, now that's quite a bit to lose. Now think about it. I mean, your animals, your stock, what you make your living on, that's your job. He took that away. He even killed the men that worked for you, employees, men that you know, men that you took care of. He killed them. And then most of all, he killed all his children. This is what happened to Job. Again, as I'm as I'm teaching, put yourself in Job's place. Y'all don't have any children, so y'all, y'all not there yet. I have children. I have been there. And believe me, this is a no way bragging. No way bragging. I still praise. I still praise and worship God when He took my daughter to heaven with Him. Why? Because I knew she was going to heaven and I knew that I was going to see her again. So I did not curse God. I did not blame God. And it's not because, man, Jesse, you're so spiritual. No, it has nothing to do with me. Y'all hear me. It has nothing to do with me. All I had to do was believe. God showed me those scriptures. He showed me. Now am I going to believe it? And I did believe it. And so since I believe what God said... That's, is what my, what, that's what pulled me through it. God pulled me through it with His words. Are y'all hearing me? His words pulled me through it. His words. Not Jesse. Do not give me any credit. It is wrong to give me any credit. It is wrong for me to take any credit. It had nothing to do with me. God pulled me through. Because of His words. What He showed me. That's why I made it through that time. Because of the Lord. Verse 20. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Did y'all hear what I just read? He just lost his children. His children. His flesh and blood. His children. He just lost them. They just died. Job arose, tore off his clothes, shaved his head. But then what did he do? He fell down. What did I tell you about worship? Every time you find worship in the Bible, it's people falling down. That's why I say we don't worship. We praise God, but we don't worship Him. Right here it says He fell down on the ground and worshiped. Put yourself in Job's shoes. Job just lost everything. And not just everything, but his children. And what did he do? He worshiped God. Worshiped God. He did not know that Satan did it. He just knew this happened to him. He could have blamed God. God, why would you let this happen? 
I've been a righteous man. I've been obedient to you. Why did you let this? Job could have done all that. Is that what it says right here? No, it said, it said he fell down and worshiped God. Now, tearing off his clothes, that's through the Bible. When someone died, that's what they would do. In Genesis 37, 34, it says, And Jacob rent his clothes and put on sackcloth upon his loans and mourned for his son many days. In Joshua 7, 6, And Joshua rent his clothes, meaning tore of his clothes, and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eve tide, and he and the elders of Israel put dust on their heads. Now that's what they did. When, when, when someone died, this is what they would do. They would tear off their clothes. So this was a, a, a I, w- I would say, a custom that they did in Israel. When they mourned, they tore off their clothes. Just like David did. When his son died, David did the same thing. King David. Yeah, uh, in some other places is uh, they fasted, and we're going to get on that. But this is this is the way they showed their mourning. Verse twenty one, and said, "Naked came." Now this is Job. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job did not understand why this was going on but believed that his trouble came from the Lord. He believed at this time that the trouble came from God because right here it says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. So Job is saying, the Lord gives, but he takes it away also. So right here, he, now he's starting to kind of point to God that this is why it happened. But he didn't turn from God. I, this has happened to him because of God, but he's not turning from God. Okay. How many times do we do the same thing? How many times do we do the same thing in, in little stuff? We blame God. We do that. Don't say you've never done it. If something bad has happened in your life, something that you really didn't like, many times, many times. Well, God, why would you let that happen? We blame the Lord. Instead of cursing God, sometimes we need to just praise Him. No. Did I say sometimes? All the time. Instead of cursing Him, we need to praise Him. Whatever, listen to me, whatever is not going good in your life, whatever it is, if it's something, somebody, whatever it is that you're not liking in your life, don't blame God. Praise God. Say, Lord, I don't know why this is, I don't know why you're letting this happen. You're not cursing Him. But like I said, it's okay to ask why. You're not cursing Him. But whatever, whatever reason you're allowing this to happen, I praise you anyway. I'm still going to praise you. Y'all hear me? I mean, that is, come on. Do y'all hear me? Yeah. I mean, seriously. We're, we're now, right now, we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you, yeah. Maybe right now, the waters are calm in your life. Right now. So when the times do get tough, when the trials or testing does come, remember this teaching. Remember this teaching. And then you ask yourself, how am I going to react? Because right now you can pretty much easily say, Oh, I'll, I'll still praise God. That's because the waters are calm right now in your life. Wait till they get rough. Then ask yourself, Can I do what Job did? In verse 22, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job didn't turn his back on the Lord, is what this is saying. He didn't turn his back on, on the Lord. And knowing God doesn't bring evil upon us, or, or even that he's a mean God, Job never did blame the Lord. This teaching is a teaching that we need to keep here and remember. What Job went, to, he lost and he lost and he lost. And, and what did he do? He praised God. I asked y'all if y'all were ready for this one. All right. I asked y'all if y'all were ready because Job is a deep spiritual book that will show you, that will show us. I keep saying you, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in there too. Remember that. It's showing us where are we going to be when this kind of trials, when this kind of tribulation, when this kind of test come to us. What are we going to do? And right now would be a nice time to say, well, this is the way I want to be. So if I'm going to be that way, what do I need to do? I need to grow in the Lord.
then I'm probably going to do just the opposite from what Job did.